when we come to this passage real quickly, just by way of review from what we were, what we looked at a couple of Wednesday nights ago, when you come to 2 Corinthians, of course, it is called 2 Corinthians because it is a second of two letters. It is a ladder of two letters um, that the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to uh, believers in the city of Corinth in a region of the world, in a region that was called Achaia, and uh, a province there. Uh, Corinth was a city of over 750,000 people uh, that was filled with great wickedness, filled with great sin. Uh, they were known for wealth, and they were known for spending their wealth on things uh, that God is not pleased with, on wine, women, and song, and all of the, uh, all of the uh, sensual pleasures of life that uh, those that do not know the Lord are, uh, are engaging in. That is what had made its way into this church, and the first letter that Paul uh, wrote to this church at Corinth was reminding them uh, that, their, that their life for God had been tainted by the world uh, in which they were uh, living in, uh, that they had, uh, had embraced some things uh, that the lost around them were embracing. They had attitudes and mentality uh, that mirrored that of the world, and their actions mirrored that of the lost world as well. Paul, as their pastor, as their spiritual leader, as the church planner that started their church, writes an entire letter in 1 Corinthians dealing with those sins and appealing for them to repent of their sin and get right with God. And when it comes into this second letter, my, uh, time has passed, and uh, now uh, the Apostle Paul is encouraged by a visit from one of his young protégés in the ministry, Titus, that has come to him with a good report that as he sent the first letter, even though it was hard for the Corinthians and those in Achaia to read, they had done exactly what he wanted them to do. They saw the glaring need of their hearts to be right with God, and they asked God to forgive them of their sins, and they began to live a life that was more pleasing to the Lord. And as we come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, uh, we find a much lighter tone, if I could uh, put it that way. Paul is not lo no longer rebuking them and reproving them, but Paul is exhorting them. Paul is trying to lift them up. He's trying to encourage them, and he's trying to encourage them in a moment of great suffering. He mentions in uh, chapter number 1 and verse number 8, we read it just a minute ago, he talks in verse number 8, he says, We would not, uh, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came uh, to us in Asia, talking about trouble that he himself experienced. He said that we were pressed out of measure above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. He said in verse number 9 that it looked like he had a sentence of death in himself, and uh, those laboring with him felt the same way. Uh, Paul said he's went through trouble that he felt like that it was certain that he was going to lose his life in the midst of this difficulty. And in verse number 6 and 7, Paul says um, that he knows that they are uh, in, that they are partakers, verse 7, of the sufferings with them. That Paul realizes it's not just me that is going through trouble for the cause of Christ. He says, I know you have entered into this. You are a believer. Your name is attached as a church to my name because I planted that church. And what I'm facing for the gospel sake, because you have a relationship with me and with Christ, you are suffering for the gospel's sake as well. Paul said, we are suffering and we know that you're suffering and that just because we're saved and living for God does not mean that trials and tribulation and hard days do not come. Paul said that he, as he's serving Jesus, as he is writing verses of scripture and God is through his hand and through his pen inspiring the very words of God despite Paul being the most faithful Christian in the New Testament, amen, to live despite him being one that God is using to pin down the very verses that we're reading in the Bible this morning, he still had trouble that he could not shake and that God did not remove from him. We were reminded 
just a couple of weeks ago. I didn't take the time to read it, nor will I do it this morning, but uh, the 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul gives, uh, gives details of the things that he has faced in his ministry for the cause of Christ. We did go in detail the last time we were here about what Paul experienced in the book of Acts between his salvation in Acts chapter number 9 to the very last chapter of the book of Acts. We I discovered that, that Paul was a man that really that knew what it was to suffer, that serving Jesus was not always easy street for Paul. And Paul lets these, these Corinthians know that he understands what they're going through because he is going through it too. Can I say this this morning, that one of the most comforting things in moments of trials when we're going through difficult days and tribulation is number one, to know that that we are not alone. Amen. And number two, to know that what we're going through, others uh, have been through as well, and that they were able to uh, make it to the other side, if I can use that terminology, to make it to the upside of the valley, to make it to the other side of the uh, great expanse of the trial that uh, they were going through, that they survived uh, to fight another day and to go on another day, and they made it through. What an encouragement it is to us that if somebody else can make it through, we can make it through too. Paul is telling them that I know where you are. I know what you've been through. And Paul in these words is trying to comfort them and exhort them and be a blessing to them to lift their spirits. And he does so in the words of verse number 3 and 4, it begins his words as he is seeking to be a comfort and a blessing to those that later in the chapter, as we've already seen this morning, he describes that he knows what they're going through. And so before he de details that in verse number 6, 7, and 8, uh, he does tell us that he uh, does know the solution for suffering. He knows the solution for problems. He knows the answer for those days where we don't know what to do and all we need is a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. Paul says before he even told them that he uh, mentions about their detail mentions about their difficulty in detail Paul said I've already got the answer for you. Amen. Amen. He says it for us here in verse number 3 and verse number 4 he said blessed be God. Now, let me pause there before we read any further and just say that in those three words, really in the last of those three words, in that word G-O-D, Paul already has illumined for them the solution to the problem of tribulation, the solution to the problems of suffering, the solution to the problem of being hopeless and living in hopeless times. You say, preacher, what's the answer? God is the answer. He's the solution for whatever you're going through this morning. It doesn't matter what you came uh, walking in the door with. Uh, don't get me wrong. It matters to me. It matters to this church. We hate to see people carrying heavy burdens. And in this church we've had uh, many of our families carrying many uh, difficult burdens already. And we hate to hear that. But I'm telling you it doesn't matter how deep the valley is, how dark the discouragement is, or how terrible the tribulation is. God is the solution for it all. Now let me, let me say this, it doesn't always mean that God's going to take away the trouble. It doesn't always mean that God is going to take away the problem. But I am telling you there is a calm in the midst of the storm that for those of us that are saved, that only God can give. And that's what Paul is telling this church at Corinth in these verses. He is telling them, in essence, when he mentions in verse number 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforted us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. In those two verses, in a nutshell, he is illuminating and answering the question, Why do we go through what we go through. 
He is talking to them about what they're going through. He's talking to them about what he is himself going through. And he is giving them the answer to the very reasoning of God behind why they're facing what they're facing. We see, and this is, this, I'll, I'll mention this this morning. I didn't have time but just to introduce this. The first answer to the question of why do we go through what we go through, he mentions it here in verse number three. Why do we go through what we go through? Number one, we go through what we go through to learn a new characteristic of God. The Bible gives us in verse number 3, Paul under the inspiration of God, God moving his hand and moving his heart to pin down these words. He begins it with, blessed be God. And then he begins to describe who God is. He gives us here in this passage several characteristics of who God is. He says that God is even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, the first thing that he mentions is that he's God. He is the one and true God. The second thing he says is that he, that he is a God that is the Father of Jesus Christ. For those of us that are saved, it ought to be a comfort to us to know uh, that he is the one by which we have our Savior. Amen. The one that even if life causes us problems down here, all the way to the grave even. If, if our trouble is so bad that we die from it down here because he He's the Father of Jesus Christ. That means uh, that in all of eternity, even if it was that bad in life, in, in life down here, amen, there's an eternity coming where old things are passed away and all things become new, not just in a physical, a spiritual sense like, how, like it happens when we get saved, but in a very physical sense. Right. Everything's different. Hey. Paul said, or, or excuse me, John said in the book of the Revelation, he he says, speaking about heaven, he says that it is a place where the former things are passed away. Right. No tears, no sorrow, no sin. What we have there is the Savior and what has been bought by His sacrifice on Calvary for us. All of heaven, amen, is the inheritance of the child of God and that's where we're headed if it gets as bad as it can get down here. Amen. That's what we have to look forward to. He's the Father of Jesus Christ. That's a characteristic that they, that this church of Corinth has known from the moment of salvation. He also says he's the Father of mercies. The word Father here in our Bible just simply, when it comes to mercy, is being used to indicate that He is the origin. He's the source. Every mercy we get in life has come because of God. Every time God has not given us what we deserve, it's come because of God. He is the Father of mercies. And you and I that are saved this, this, uh, uh, this morning, we can rejoice in that. He has provided for us a Savior. And through the Savior, we have the mercy of God, not just in the moment of salvation, but each and every day God gives mercy after mercy. Lamentations uh, Jeremiah said that his mercies are new every morning. Amen. He is the father of mercies. Amen. He is also, he says here, the God of all comfort. The fact that he is God the fact that he is the father of Jesus Christ, our Savior, the fact that he is the father of mercies is something that you and I can find wrapped up in the simplest verses of Scripture, wrapped up in the gospel message. Those three things are things that you'll know about God from a very rudimentary and elementary level. If you know enough to be saved and you know enough of the gospel to place your faith in Christ, you already read know those three things. You cannot place your faith in Jesus Christ without believing that God sent His Son and believing that His Son is as much God as the Father is. If you do not believe that, you will never be able to truly place your faith in believing something that, Je that believing that Jesus is not who He is. You must understand that He is the Father of mercies because when you call out to Him for salvation, you're begging God for His mercy on you, a sinner. 
These are things that we already know from accepting Christ. Things we already understand about who He is. But can I submit to you this morning that this, this, this last line in verse number 3 is something that you will not truly understand about God until He lets you walk through the school of suffering. It is not something you may know it as a doctrinal truth from reading the Bible. But to walk in and live these truths is something that God's got to let you go through some things. God's got to let you go through trials. And while you're in the thick of it all, He will show you and illuminate to you a new characteristic of who He is. He's not just the Savior. He's not just the one that is merciful. He's not just those things. But He will be in that moment the God of all comfort. He is illuminating to us who He is. He's telling us plainly who He is. And now we understand that unless we go through things, we'll never truly understand what He means by the fact that He is the God of all comfort. I'll tell you this this morning, I have learned in my life that He is the God of all comfort. In my young life, 20, I'm 29 years of age. I've been preaching since the age of 8 years old. I had preached most of my family's funerals by the time I turned 21 years old. Most of my family is in the grave. And I stood and pre I remember I was 14 years old when I stood and took part in my in my uncle's funeral I was 16 years old when I let's see 15 years old when I took place in my great grandmother's funeral 16 years old when I preached my father's funeral I was uh, 18 years old when I preached my and officiated the entire funeral for my grandfather and then I was 21 years old when I buried my mom and preached her funeral. I can tell you this morning that in all of those moments, I mean, if it's not for the grace of God, how do you prepare a message for your mama, for your daddy, for your, the only grandparents I ever knew? How do you do that? And I can submit to you this, and my wife will be a testimony. And don't take this wrong. Don't take this as I'm heartless. But I prepared all those messages without shedding a tear. Now, I can't tell you I delivered those messages without shedding a tear. But in that time to where it was just, I couldn't even imagine how I would prepare those messages. God put a message from His Word in my heart. Amen. And I was able to preach this very text at my grandfather's funeral and encourage our family that He's the God of all comfort. And in that moment, I was able to point back to the other times that God has shown me that He's a God of all comfort. As I've as a pastor, as I've put my arms around people in our congregation who are begging God for miracles. As I've held my hands with people that through, eyes flooded with tears, prayed for God to do the insurmountable earthly speaking. I knew in my heart that God could because He had done it in my life time and time again. Amen. That's the whole meaning of this passage that God is telling us and unfolding for us day by day and trial by trial a new characteristic of Himself. And I know we all want to live lives free, free of trials and free of temptations, but you'll never learn this about God. God unless He allows you to walk through suffering. Some of you that's walked through 
very hard and difficult days, even as of late, burying loved ones and dealing with family members riddled with sicknesses and issues. You understand, as I have, that there is a heightened level that God lets you enter into Him. There is a new level of closeness that the Lord will let you have of Him. There have been, and that's not that in other times God doesn't want you to have that, but oftentimes it's not until we go through these trials where we need Him the most and our hearts are open and our hearts are bleeding and we are just at the very wit's end that we call out for God and say, God, I'll give you everything if you'll just help. And God in this passage tells us that he will come closer and that he will, he will let you discover a gem in the midst of great trial and great tragedy. You'll get to know more of who He is. This passage doesn't mean as much to those who haven't been through much. But for those that have walked in the valley, the fact that we have a God that is the God of all comfort is a wonderful joy and worthy of giving God glory for this morning. Amen. The Bible here calls Him the God of all comfort. You, this church knows by now how much I love to preach on the words of Scripture. I don't have to have a chapter to have a message. Sometimes there's more, uh, and there's more message and we can handle in one little word. The Bible in this terminology that God, this, this moniker that God gives Himself of being the God of all comfort means first of all that that definite article the T-H-E there it means that he is the one and only nobody can do this but him nobody can be this but him God this is a term that means not just God the Father any longer but this terminology here of uh, being the God of all comfort means that it expands beyond just the Father and it also incorporates Jesus Christ the Son and the Holy Spirit of God as well. God the entire Trinity is a, is a God to us of all comfort. They are all individually involved in giving you the comfort you need in your trial the only way that I was able to be able to write those sermons and preach those messages was because there was a Holy Ghost of God that had been sent by the Son and commissioned by the Father and the Spirit of God who John said would be the comforter. He came to where I was. He met me at that little dining room table as a 16-year-old boy. As I opened my Bible, I said, God, you've got to give me something to say in my daddy's funeral. And I remember God, almost immediately I opened my Bible, and wherever I opened my Bible to, I looked, my eyes on the page, and it was John chapter number 14. And God, Jesus said to his disciples in John 14, I couldn't, be, I, couldn't, I couldn't believe it, Brother Tommy. When I looked down, I read the words, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it, hey Amen. He goes on to describe that. I've gone to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there you may be also. And he gives those words, and I was able to preach that. And God used it to help folks at the amen to help folks at the funeral and if it didn't help anybody else it helped me but it took God the Father sending the Son and the Son commissioning the Spirit and sending the Spirit into the world to indwell the believers as he says he would do in the Gospel of John I'm thankful this morning that we have a Spirit of God that can go where others cannot go he is, if I'm saved by the grace of God and I know that I am if you're saved by the grace of God and I hope you know that you are that comfort does not just come from without but if you're saved God has given us the spirit of God that can go all the way inside of you and indwell you and not just give you peace in your mind and comfort in your mind and comfort on an external level but can go into the depths of who you are and give you peace within that's the God we have he's the God this may not mean much to you, but it made me want to shout as I studied this message. Notice that little two-letter word, of. If he's the God of something, 
I'm not an English teacher. But y'all wouldn't believe that by the way I preach most of my messages. <laughs> but Brother Jeremy, the word of means that he's a God that possesses something. It is a word of possession. It means the Bible's about to tell us something that God has. That only He has this. And He is the only one that has the right and the true ability to dispense what only He has. He says He's the God of all comfort. Amen. You say, I need comfort this morning. Well, can I say this? You've come to the right place. Amen. Amen. We're in the house of the one that you come to that has in his possession comfort that you need. Amen. Only he can give it to you this morning. Amen. He's the God of all comfort. That word all in every language in the world means exactly that. It means all. It means nothing excluded. No matter what kind of comfort you need. No matter what amount of comfort you need. Whether small or large. Can I tell, tell you this morning. I'm glad to report that there's a God in heaven. And he lives in my heart that has all of the comfort I or anyone else will ever need. He's the God of all comfort. He wants us to understand this about himself, that he is the God of all comfort. Comfort me is a word here uh, that in the Greek language is the word paraclete, not parakeet, amen, but paraclete. It's the same word that, the, that Jesus used for the Spirit of God, comforter. It is, the same, it is a derivative of the same word. And what that word literally means, what the word comfort means is to... Let me borrow somebody this morning. Honey, you, let me borrow my wife. i got to get close to somebody and he's too short. <laughs> She's trying to offer up my oldest boy. I'd have to lift him up to do this. Amen. Might have to lift you up to do this too. I don't know. We'll see. I've got this thing tugging. It's driving me nuts. Y'all need to hear me though, so I'll leave it on. Here's what the word means. The comforter means that in that moment when you're broken and you're at your wit's end and you're at the bottom and it seems like there is no light and there is no hope to be found, him being the God of all comfort, that word means that he will pull you close. It means to call to one side. It means to bring near. <laughs> I don't know if you're, if you're picking up what I'm laying down this morning, but aren't you glad that we have a God that when we are broken and we're pouring, a, pouring out of our eyes a puddle of tears in prayer, that there is a God who in the moment you cry out to him for help, no matter how distant you are, no matter how far away you may feel, he will pull you in and he will pull you close and he will hold you in that moment of difficulty and he will be be there to comfort and to console you. Amen. Let me ask you this this morning. Does anybody in church this morning know what it is to have the God of glory hold you close? Does anybody in church this morning knows what it is to feel the arms of a loving God wrapping around you in the moment of your difficulty, in the moment of your trouble, uh, trouble and trial and pull you in and comfort you and caress you and love on you and let you know it's all going to be okay? Amen. I have. I hope you have. And if you're here this morning and that's what you need, God said the only reason why he lets us go through what we go through is because unless he sends the trial so many times, we are content being far away. We are content even pushing him away in our life. He wants to be close. And by the way, you'll be as close to God as you want to be. Right. Right. But here's what we do when everything's okay. 
I don't need him as much. I don't need my Bible as much. I don't need to pray as much. And we push him away. And I'll say this, I'm glad this morning that even though I've been there at times, and I hate to admit it, but even though I've been there to where I don't hold him as close as I should, when I need him, he is still willing. If I say, God, I've been messed up and I'm wrong and I'm sorry, but I need your help. He's not going to do what I like we would do. Well, you pushed me away, so I'm going to push you away. Amen. You missed a good opportunity to push me. Amen. But I'm going to push you away, and you push me away. But he says, I'm going to pull you close. I know what you've done to me. I know you hadn't wanted much to do with me. I know you hadn't been interested in what I have for you, but I'm going to hold you close, and I'm going to be there for you. He's the God of all comfort. I can't do this for you. We can't do this for each other. But God can do that for us. Amen. He's done it in the moments I've needed him to do it. Thank you, honey. I'm telling you this morning, what a beautiful word in the scriptures. He is telling us that he is the one that when we are going through the most difficult challenges in our life, when our hearts are broken, when our emotions are absolutely wrecked, when we don't know what to do, or even if anything can be done, when it seems like there's no chance or no hope at all for a better day, and when your pulse is racing and your nerves are shot, and when your heart is pounding, I'm thankful this morning that He will be one. But when you call upon Him, we'll come to where you are, but He'll bring you to where He is, and it's a place where He has the sovereign God of heaven as one who is not moved by the troubles and trials of life. He is above all of them. The things, amen, uh, the waters, as the songwriter said, the storms and waters of life that are over our heads, thank God, are under his feet. Amen. We don't have to worry when he's the one in control. He's not unnerved. Listen to me this morning. He's not unnerved by what you're going through. He's not bothered like you are by what's bothering you. Amen. He is not shaken or out of sorts, but he'll bring you to a place where he is completely confident in what he can do for you. He'll bring you to a place that he has already known from the beginning. He, by bringing you to where he is, allows you to rest in his position. Close and right by where you are and just where you need him to be. And he will give you consa, he'll give you solace, he'll give you comfort, and he'll give you encouragement for what lies ahead. He will bring you as close to him as you'll let him. And when it seems like he is holding you close, he is doing just that, consoling you and letting you realize that every single time you ever need him that's exactly what he'll do Amen. let me say this I'm going to have to be done here I've enjoyed that so much this morning Amen. my wife you a minute ago you tried to get Wyatt to come up here Wyatt let me borrow you for just a minute <laughs> I pick on my family because I know they got to go home with me and they don't get a say whether they like it or not. <clears throat> they, they don't really have much of a say in, in what I do up here. I'm just as much their pastor as I am yours. Amen. But I get to be daddy to him too, so he's, du he's, he, he's doubly, <laughs> yeah, he's, hey, Brother Cody, you said doubly blessed. I'm doubly uh, whatever words you want to use, but nobody, he, he's not going to get, a, he's not gonna get a, uh, an opinion. Let me say this this morning. You think about us as believers. If you're saved, you're a child of God. Amen. The Bible says that. He is the Father of Jesus Christ. He's the Father of mercies and He's the God of all comfort. Two times in that one verse we're reminded that He is a Father. The Bible says if we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children so how, how much more the Heavenly Father. He is a perfect Father. I'll say this though this morning and I don't need any, any testimony. But I'll be honest, 
you're not looking at a perfect father. I wish I could say that. But there's only one perfect father who's ever, who has ever existed, and it's our God. Amen. But what, we're see, what we see here in this passage is God being our father. There's been many times in Wyatt's almost six years of life, November 7th, he'll be six. And uh, he wants you to memorize that date so you can bring him a gift. <laughs> Amen. I know, he, I know his heart. November 7th, he'll be six years old. In his almost six years of life, there have been many times where he has had things that, as all children do, has caused him to be emotional, to be in pain, sometimes of his own of his own activity to be in pain. So many things that cause our children to be upset and hurt and broken. I'm not a perfect father, but I can say this, that every time any of my children have ever needed me and they're hurting and their eyes are filled with tears and they're, they're emotional or whatever the case may be from the cradle all the way to where they are right now, They've had, a, they've had a daddy that you may not be an emotional daddy, but I don't have any problem letting my children hear their daddy pray for them, cry with them. I don't have a problem holding my children. I don't have a problem kissing my children, hugging on my children, and letting them know that their daddy loves them. And the reason I don't have any problem with that is because I have felt in a perfect sense what it's like for God to do that for me. But when my son has, been, has needed me, and there's been many times, he knows what it is for his daddy to just hug on him and love him. I don't know if y'all ever do this, but when my kids are hurting, I don't know, it's just a habit of mine. I'll, I'll hold them close and I'll hold their head close to my heart and I'll stroke their hair or I'll pat their hand or rub their hand, just trying to give them some comfort. And you know, most of the time, and you that are parents in here know exactly what I'm talking about. Most of the time, I have not changed anything that's happening to my children. The pain's still there. But when Wyatt broke his arm, me hugging him and Mama hugging him didn't change the fact that he had a broken arm. It was still there. But you know what changed? It changed in here. He wasn't as upset about it anymore because he knew that as long as I'm close to Daddy, everything's okay. Sometimes this little boy of mine he is like a typical child does. He's afraid of bumps in the nine and things like that. He's afraid of the days we're living in. And why, Daddy, why do we got to lock up all the doors, son? Because there's people that don't know the Lord and people that'll do bad things. And we just want to keep you protected. And there's many times that he just needs to know Daddy's checked the locks. He just needs to know that Daddy knows what's going on and Daddy cares and it makes him feel completely consoled and safe. Can I say this this morning? We have a God that knows whatever you're going through. We have a God who cares about what you're going through. We have a God that is able. He's able to change the external. He's able in a moment, if he wanted to take the trial away, to do so. Sometimes it's more needful for us to walk through the trials so we learn this characteristic about him and we learn the lessons we need to learn. But even if God leaves the trial, we have a God that's going to pull us close and that will allow us to experience peace within, even though nothing has changed on the outside. You may be going through something today that you came into church this morning and it was absolutely weighing you down to where you wondered if you would even come this morning or whether you would just stay at the house and keep the covers pulled over your head and not come out until Monday morning. You may have come in here this morning dealing with something that heavy, but coming here and leaving, it may not change what you go back home to. But if you'll find a place in an altar, if you'll find a place of prayer, 
here this morning, you can meet with a God that cares and that'll hold you close and let you know Daddy knows about everything. That there's a Father in heaven who cares and that He knows what you're going through and He's able to console you. He may not call me. You have a seat, buddy. Thank you. He may not calm the storm without, but he may just choose to calm the storm within. And really, if I'm not being, if I'm being honest, if I'm being honest, is that not the place that we need help the most? Not necessarily what we're going through, but how our emotions are being wrecked by what we're going through. God wants us, we'll pick up here tonight, but he wants us to learn a new characteristic about himself. I wonder this morning, have you learned it? Have you let God minister to your heart in that way? Do you need it today? And if you do, will you let God love on you one more time? Right.